A really warm welcome to, to everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people who've been able to um, prioritise some time this afternoon to be able to gather. And um, I know that you're in for an absolute treat this afternoon with our, with our session. So for those of you who are, are new to the Create HDR sessions, um, we meet um, each month. We had a little uh, winter hiatus uh, where we um, bunkered down for a little while, but we're back now that it's a beautiful springtime um, back for um, our next session, our third session of the HDR Create series for the year. Um, so we meet normally on a Thursday afternoon and um, our next session, of course, will be in, in September. So my name is Sue Olovich and it's a pleasure to, to welcome you today. I'm one of the a student at the University of Sydney and I also have a lovely role of just hosting uh, the Create HDR series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who have joined us today. And you're welcome to um, introduce yourself in the chat. You might like to acknowledge the land upon which you're joining us from today. Um, just a reminder that we record the sessions and the sessions are always available afterwards on the Create um, YouTube channel. So you can always go back and revisit them. And um, uh, for those people who aren't able to join us today, they're able to, uh, to view them as well. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Melly Green. Let me tell you a little bit um, about Melly. Melly lectures in the Faculty of Education at Southern Cross University in literacy and English teaching. And she shares a love of high quality children's books. She's been a primary school teacher for over 25 years with 20 of those years in the classroom and teach librarianship and five in curriculum leadership. Millie completed her PhD in 2021 and her doctoral research explored student engagement in reading for enjoyment in the upper primary years. And her areas of research passion are children's literature in the primary classroom, reading instruction, curriculum and pedagogy. And you may recall that we had Professor Liz McKinley present a session earlier this year on departing radically in academic writing. Well, Melly's also an active member of departing, acad departing radically in ac academic writing, the draw group. And we're especially fortunate that she's going to share some of her lived experience of composing a PhD thesis um, in a radical departure from academic writing. And so her presentation for us this afternoon, and this is going to be a tricky one for me to get to my tongue around, Melly, uh, it's Drawing on Palimpsests, Poetry and Play Script, Composing a PhD Thesis in a Radical Departure from academic writing. So I know we're in for a treat this afternoon and it's a real pleasure, Melly, to welcome you to our session. So over to you. Thank you, Susan. You did very well there. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, I will share screen if that's okay. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm not sure what stage of your um, PhD journey you're, you're up to. I'd, I'd love to know if you're happy to write it in the chat. I think we've got a variety, Melly, of people beginning, people thinking about beginning, people um, Wonderful. putting toes in the water, people just completed. So there's a whole, um, a whole range. Excellent. That's what I was hoping. Okay. Can you see my screen, a full screen? You can. Oh, good. Now, that photo, I, I'm not kind of, um, you know, I, I guess I, I don't take lots of photos of myself. I'd hate you to get that impression of me. But that day I um, I got my confirmation um, confirmed, which, which was just wonderful. And it was kind of one of the proudest days of my life, you know, and uh yeah, it took 12 months. It took exactly 12 months to get there. And where I did my PhD at UQ, I was lucky to have the corner desk. And, um, you know, people would pin different things on the wall there. 
that um, now and again I could draw inspiration from. So in the background, uh, that there's a, a poster there on what PhD stands for, you know, the perseverance and hard work, dedication, uh, and I think a couple of swear words as well. Um, and, you know, what ontology means and epistemology, you know, when you first start and you have to learn these things and understand what this means to your research, uh, it, it, it's a journey. It really is. Um, so thank you for that lovely welcome. I, I would also like to acknowledge country. I'm here in Turbal country. Um, I live just off Waterworks Road in Ashgrove. I don't know if any of you are in Brisbane, but it's a, a main arterial here, this yellow line. Um, that is otherwise called State Route 31, for those of you who like to fact check. And it was the, the track of the original inhabitants of this part of Brisbane, the Turbal people. And that was the track back in, I think it's 1929, that has now become this arterial. Um, but, but I live off Waterworks Road. My school is just off Waterworks Road. So I really like to imagine the, the Turbal people as they made their way from the uh, city centre of Brisbane up to Mount Kutha for the honeybee dreaming. You know, I'm walking in their footsteps um, well, when, I, when I walk along my street. Uh, and in language, Galang Nurundai is good day. So what I'd like to share with you today is a little bit, I, I guess, about you know, how I've come to this study, how I've come to do this PhD. Um, my absolute love affair with John Dewey. Um, yeah, I spent three years. Sorry, Robin. I know. <laughs> um, I, I do love John Dewey and, and I know, you know, he's a man of his time. And definitely there are some feminist kind of principles we need to tell John Dewey about. Um, observe the happy housewife tending to a pot plants is not my favourite quote of his. Um, and then to, to talk about my PhD research and then and, and the writing, how I came to write the thesis and then give you a, an example of one of my presentations I've prepared earlier. Um, as, as an example of this radical departure in academic writing. So, so I, um, unfortunately, my, my beautiful dad passed away last year and I had to go over to England and I found in his loft an autobiography I'd written at the end of year two um, when I got my pen license. And I vaguely remember writing it, but it kind of did stop me in my tracks. Uh, I've written, I'm going to be a teacher or lecturer. You know, I, I I didn't, I wasn't aware that I knew the word lecturer then. And yet here I am now. Um, I will teach geography, English or maths. I'd like to teach 11 to 15 year olds. In the summer holidays, I'm going to take the children who behave well and worked hard out on my boat. Um, uh, I, I, I still feel the sentiment now, you know. Um, but but here is my uh, love of learning, I guess. Uh, I did start a teacher training course in 1989 um, to fulfill that dream, my seven year old dream, but uh, love and wanting to come traveling to Australia kind of derailed me for a few years. Um, but I went back to England and did um, a degree in librarianship. I couldn't get into teacher training. I'd come back too late to start the September um, semester. So I did um, uh, an honours degree in, in my second love, I guess, books and libraries in librarianship, and then went on to do a grad cert um, through a school-centred initial teacher training. And it was a, a brand new thing at the time. I believe it's going very well now in England, kind of a little bit different to a Bachelor of Education in a traditional university sense, in that you start school day one with your mentor teacher day one, and you go to school three or four days a week, and then do your university studies on the fifth day and after school. Um, I to this day, I'm grateful I was able to do that. You know, I, I really think I got that um, 
that uh, nexus of theory and practice, the lived experience of it. Um, and then I uh, came to Brisbane via Sydney and uh, wanted to teach in the Catholic system. Um, so I went and did uh, another uh, postgraduate in arts education. Um, I worked as a teacher librarian. At the time, there was talk that all teacher librarians were going to be axed from the system. Um, and, you know, I'm an advocate of arts education. So I went and did that and then did my master's um, in educational studies and finally uh, came to my PhD uh, in 2018. So had the great fortune of doing it 2018 and 19 on campus, in schools before COVID hit. Um, which, again, I'm, I'm so very grateful for. But uh, I actually do kind of identify as a primary teacher even now. Um, you know, I've been teaching in university for six years, but, but, but my heart is in a primary education. I'm very lucky. I've been at the same school for 23 years, um, but very local primary school, and I am on a kind of contract of one day a term. I keep my staff entitlements for 23 years and my beautiful dean at SCU is very supportive because I still have recency of classroom practice. You know, I can talk about my year three students, my year five students. We just did a big art project last week, which was so, so much fun. Um, so I, I really do kind of carry that with me. I'm a primary teacher and a teacher librarian kind of first, a uh, teacher librarian of 20 years. So I carry this, um, yeah, these, these, I guess, narratives and narrator voices in my head the whole time of children's books. Um, and what, what I've seen in 28 years now of primary education um, is great success in matching the right book with the right child and developing them as a reader, a reader who really loves reading. Um, you know, that's one of the great privileges of, of the teach librarianship role. Um, and then what I saw, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago, was a, a real shift in the focus, you know, I went to a professional development day where I was, uh, we were given the new literacy position paper and we were to toe the line. It was a kind of manifesto and nowhere in the literacy position paper was there any reference to student engagement in reading for enjoyment. And this is a really, really important mandated entitlement for students. It's in the curriculum. Um, uh, you may know we're just shifting from version 8.4 to version 9. We've had version 8.4 for 13 years and in it it states across every single year level students engage with a variety of texts for enjoyment. They listen, read in, in two texts in which the primary purpose is aesthetic. So this has been key to my role, key to my work and then I, I went into uh, curriculum leadership and primary learning leadership, where the focus was very much on performance metrics. And I guess visible learning became big and the work of John Hattie and Know Thy Impact. And this photo here, I took on a visit of New Zealand schools where the students were leveled in their reading and put, you know, moved their photographs or avatars along the levels. And my experience, my professional experience was that reading for enjoyment was definitely becoming sidelined. I could see issues with performance metrics and data. And then this kind of popped up in my Facebook page as these things spookily do. Um, uh, uh, it's a quote of Michael Rosen's in a, um, a cartoon by Chris Riddell. The data have landed. First, they said they needed data about the children to find out what they're learning. Then they said they needed data about the children to make sure they are learning. Then the children only learned what could be turned into data. Then the children became data. 
Uh, and this kind of didn't sit right with me. You know, I was worried. Um, I, I could see the, the NAPLAN data kind of um, flatlining. And I decided after a talk with a counsellor, to um, a careers counsellor, to um, apply and do a PhD, you know, and I applied to a few different universities and was very lucky to, to be offered um, a place with a scholarship at UQ with these wonderful supervisors, Associate Professor Louise Phillips, Dr. Linda Diane Willis, and then later on, uh, she comes into my story in a big way, but uh, Associate Professor Liz McKinley. And that's my my first day. And I said, I don't really take a lot of photographs of myself. But I've got another one here that I think paints a thousand words. I, I was, I had no clue. And I don't know if you felt like that on your first day of your PhD. What am I doing here? I've been given this computer and desk and I'm to create new knowledge and I don't know what that means. You know, uh, I'm actually wearing my school name badge and I called my friends at school and they said, what are you doing wearing your name badge? And I said, I, I don't know. I think I need to come back to school. I was so, so lost. Um, and then four years later, that was my last day, my very last day, handing my keys back and moving out of my desk in the corner there. Uh, and oh, it makes me feel quite teary now. I, you know, it was such a wonderful four years of my life. I, I'm yeah, forever grateful for that experience, despite COVID. And it went through several iterations, as I'm sure your thesis will. Um, and it ended up being for the love of good stories, a narrative inquiry into a reading for enjoyment pedagogy, um, which, which recently won um, a, an outstanding thesis award with ALIA, the Australian Literacy Educators Association, which I'm, I'm so honored. And, um, you know, I wanted to mention to you as, as PhD scholars, you know, the theories that you have to engage in and the rabbit holes you go down. Um, finding the right theory definitely took the best part of a year. And I ran up and down those corridors, knocking on every professor's door. I went to every workshop, just trying to get my head around a theory and how you apply a theory and how you develop a theoretical framework. And I thought I was getting there. I really did. I was into chat theory for a while. I was looking at one of one of Bloom's taxonomies, not the famous one, but the um, the aesthetic taxonomy. I was really hell bent on that for a while. But uh, my supervisor said, no, no, that you're telling us the answers. You haven't even done your study yet. You know, I, I really needed to understand a theory that would make sense of my data, that would do this creating of new knowledge. And I came across Dewey's theory of aesthetic experience and everything made sense then, everything. Or that red thread that's meant to go through your methodology, um, through your theoretic framework, your conceptual framework, if you will, to uh, your data analysis, to write to recommendations that you can make, um, that this made sense to me. And if you're familiar with Dewey's work, his theory of experience has these three uh, dimensions of environment, sociality, and temporality, continuity. And uh, aesthetic, if you're looking at the theory of aesthetics, it is complex. It is really, really complex because it's something so personal and so deeply individual, and yet so universal too. Um, and you know, if you are educators, if you are teachers, uh, you know that the um, the overarching uh, uh, document for everything we do, the Alice Springs and Pantway Education Declaration, states that education plays a vital role in students' um, intellectual, moral, physical, aesthetic, social, spiritual, and emotional development. And yet we spend so much time looking at the, the intellectual development, you know, that which can be measured. Um, so, so understanding 
the importance of aesthetic experience as as human beings um you know became so important to understanding aesthetic appreciation and experience of literature and i kind of immersed myself in i don't know that it will capture with my um Aha! Art as Experience, Dewey's Theory. Uh, the book is 364 pages long and it's a really complex theory. So I, I, I spent hours and hours listening to it as an audio book, uh, reading alongside listening, making notes, colour coding, making spreadsheets, really trying to get to grips with it. And then you know, in, in my mind, I started to see this kind of visually, we have this environment, and often they are literature poor environments. Now we've got these leveled guided readers, and then sociality, that we have so little time for, um, you know, dialogic pedagogy, it's straight into, uh, you know, extract a fact from this text and write about it without the time for the dialogue, without the time for relationality. And then in terms of the temporality, I was seeing the lines of latitude and longitude uh, uh, of the time space kind of continuum, and then having an experience, not having experience, but having an experience and understanding reading as a transaction that had this deep um, change, transformative potential, highly educative, you know, not, um, not something that you do for leisure. You know, it, it wasn't that, it wasn't that kind of reading. It, it is highly educative. So Dewey's theory absolutely made sense. And um, yeah, I guess I'm still learning. I'm still working with it now. Um, but, I, but I hope for you um, that you find this theory that does that work for you, that everything begins to make sense. And what I wanted to do now is read a little bit of a script I wrote where I was explaining where I started with my thesis and kind of found the theory, but then had that problem of, well, well I know what I want to do with it. But how do I do it? How do I write this thing? You know, 80,000 words, which ended up being 120,000 words. And that was the short version of it. Um, so I thought if, if you will, uh, if you don't mind, if you're happy, uh, I just share some of this writing with you. And this is Act One, The Wrong Thesis. Once upon a data-driven readicidal time, a PhD student has a compelling idea. She wants to conduct the most marvelous doctoral research project and write the most magnificent thesis. I have a plan, so I have a pain in my heart so great, only research can relieve it. I'm going to conduct a study that reveals the educative reading wreckage children reside in and I will disclose the damage being done to their development. She knows just how it will look. I will create a damning report. She knows just how it will work. I will slam it down hard on the minister's desk. All she has to do is help important people, policy makers and directors, understand the problem of readerside, the systematic killing of the love of reading, often exacerbated by the inane, mind-numbing practices found in schools. And I help young people overcome problems of readerside all the time. Easy peasy. First things first, she finds an academic advisory team residing at a well-ranked academy. Dear Louise, Liz and Linda, I really need your academic advice. Next, she gathers all the research literature she can find to complete a super scholarly literature review. So many books and articles. She sets herself up in a small stall on the sixth floor of campus building 24. Four years, four years of fulsome full-time study. Our PhD student reads Hegel, Marx, Kuhn, 
John Dewey, Wolfgang Geiser, Louise Rosenblatt, Therese Kremin, Robin Ewing. So many ideological concurrences and contradictions. More John Dewey, Jeff Wilhelm, Margaret Murga, Stephen Krashen, Clendenin and Con Connolly, and more John Dewey. It is undoubtedly John Dewey who provides the cohesive red thread to my dissertation perturbation. When she's finished what she needs to do to reach her first milestone, she steps back to regard her work. She feels ready-ish for the confirmation of candidature. Yikes. She presents a proposed project in a room brimful of academic inquiry. Eek. The learned panel members cross-examine her ideas. Gosh, it is anti-establishment, overly sentimental and nostalgic, they say. You clearly don't get it, she thinks. Ironic perv pers Ironic perversities, whispers John. It needs more digital technology, they say. The antithesis of my thesis, she thinks, not at all favourable to understanding aesthetic experience, whispers John. And it doesn't feel right either. This doesn't quite feel right to me. You may feel, Mel, that the parts do not hang together. This work is emotionally toned, although having at the outset a strong felt emotion, it is not sustained. Our researcher is disappointed to discover that her proposal isn't magnificent. It isn't magnificent. All good, all good. It isn't even kind of sort of okay. It's all wrong. Our researcher gives her work a few objective tweaks and passes the University Ethics Committee. She recruits her participants and goes out into the field to begin her inquiry. She reads Dewey's 1934 Art, of, Art as Experience over and over. She listens to it on the journey to and from school each day. Dewey's words begin to make sense, make sense. John Dewey explains the aesthetic function, effect and significance of artistic works in the greatest detail. When she's finished collecting data, she stands back and takes a long look at it. I have collected a lot of data. Dewey's words nudge and niggle as she attempts to analyse the data and begin her thesis writing. I just need to write it all up. The thing is still wrong. The thesis is still wrong. She is enticed by an entreaty to depart radically in academic writing, a flyer which reads, Draw provides a platform for the new and exciting area of post-qualitative research to be explored, enabled and enacted in conversation, community and throughout creative processes of inquiry, of writing as inquiry. This year, Draw Summer School will take place over two consecutive weeks in November. Applications by the 25th of October. This is just what I need. The researcher applies sex successfully for a place. She packs her books and bags to participate in a very different way of writing and knowing. And this, this invitation to depart radically, the timing was perfect. And this community, I'm one of the original girls, the OGs, um, now has... Well, on the Facebook group, you can see there are 254 members. Uh, I, I think it's double that, actually. Uh, it's very, very active. I hope you've all joined the Facebook group at least. And Liz works tirelessly to provide free um, conferences, workshops, uh, events, camps that you can attend in person and via Zoom. And we have just... Uh, well, we're about to uh, launch this wonderful book, which 
is kind of a guidebook, but Liz won't call it a guidebook because, you know, that's not departing radically. And it really is um, a, a lot of examples and a lot of uh, guidance on writing as a method of inquiry. Uh, on creative writing for your academic work, for your scholarly work. Uh, so, so I do encourage you to at, uh, at least ask your librarians to um, purchase this for your library. Um, but but this, this kind of changed my life, this invitation to write. And what I realised was missing in my thesis was that if I want to change the world, save the world, small ambition. Um, uh, uh, and by, by writing about reading for enjoyment, the thesis, the writing had to be an enjoyable read. You know, it, it, it couldn't be that kind of uh, scientific, objective kind of writing. Um, it, it needed to have all the requirements and meet all the requirements of a PhD thesis. But more than anything, it needed to be an enjoyable read. And I, I and I got that in my heart um, as soon as I started working with Liz. And, you know, I, I wonder if there are questions about this still. And we always have to justify why we're taking this approach. And is it, in fact, scholarly writing? And, and Liz will tell you, I'm sure she has, there are four rules of play here that we absolutely uphold in our work, that it makes a substantive contribution. And this is drawn from Richardson and Pierre's work. So I, I won't go over what Liz has already said, other than those four rules. It must have aesthetic merit. You know, it must do that work. It must move your reader. It must be left uh, imprinted in some way in that kind of transaction of reading. Um, the reflexivity, the, the theory that's involved and the thinking around the theory and impact. You know, we're writing for impact. Uh, we're not writing necessarily just the fun. It is kind of fun, but, you know, that's not the purpose here. So my thesis itself then started to take shape on that very first camp. And um, if you've heard Liz talk, you know that as a draw community, a writing community, we meet every morning, eight till 10, Monday to Friday, and you drop in and out, you know, depending on your workload. I've not been attending as much as I want to this year because I've had a very heavy teaching load, but as of next week, I'll be there most mornings. Um, and from this, from this, you, you get to speak to other people about their work, their theory they're working with, the kind of writing they're doing. And, and it's professional development every day. Uh, it, it, it really is. I, I can't praise it enough here. This is what you want to do with your work. So in the end, my thesis comprises of letters um, to the reader. Um, data poetry um, from, from the interviews with teachers, especially. Um, quotes about reading for enjoyment. You know, any, um, any famous people, uh, I've definitely drawn on their work. There's some wonderful children's books. Everything I learned, I learned from a children's book. There are famous people there talking about um, how that book their year two teacher gave them to read, how the book their year four teacher gave them to read changed their life. Um, so this became very important to my work. Um, uh, with, with the... Um, with my chapters writing um, about the experiences, the reading experiences, I've written very descriptive vignettes. So I put an example of one in here and my literature review, I ended up writing as a play script and the, the, the chapter is alive in the death zone. And it's a conversation uh, between John Dewey and I, as we walk through this kind of, um, Sarajevo, a desolate kind of awful place, uh, uh, and retrace the, the history of reading for enjoyment and what's happened to it, and then how we might revive it. Um, so, so that I've written as a play script, and at the very end, 
I've written as my conclusion a um, pedagogic creed, and I'm kind of palimpsesting, and I'll talk about that in a moment, on John Dewey's pedagogic creed. Um, I, I looked recently at the stats for that, um, you know, how many times it's been quoted, how many times it's been uh, accessed, thousands and thousands, we could only dream of that, you know, it still has such relevance um, and Dewey's work still has relevance if you want to join the Dewey Society. Um, but, but I wrote a uh, Reading for Enjoyment pedagogic creed. And what I found through my research was there's no meta language to discuss aesthetic appreciation. So through the, the data collected, the interviews with my uh, teachers, the observations with children, um, I put an A to Z, a meta language together uh, as the um, conclusion. And I think I've covered all of them there. Yes, I have. Um, and what, what I, I've had to blur this because I have an embargo at the moment on my thesis because of a book contract with uh, Palgrave Macmillan that I'm uh, working very hard as of next week to finish the manuscript. Um, but what, what I did, what I came to in my analysis was that uh, aesthetic experience is always kind of um, telescoped, you know, it, it's just kind of the aims of the English curriculum. There are four to regard aesthetic appreciation, but no one's writing about them. There, there's, it's very hard to find it if you don't know what you're looking for, if you're not a reader, you know, if you don't enjoy reading it, it's really hard to find it and teach it. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of put a microscope on what is telescoped, if you will, and fan it all out and say, you know, well, the, the green is environmental. Here's what you need to do. Here, the, the pink is sociality. Here's what you need to do in terms of, you know, the relationality in your classroom and book talk. And then the yellow is the temporality, that this is slow pedagogy. You're not going to get an effect size after one lesson, um, but, but how you can monitor that. Um, so, so I really was working with this, as I say, this year four, uh, sorry, 8.4, version 8.4 um, curriculum entitlement in which the primary purpose is aesthetic became so key to my work. That was in years three to 10. As of this year, we're working with version nine. And we've still got that entitlement. Students engage with a variety of texts for enjoyment. But that, that um, part of the sentence in which the primary purpose is aesthetic has been dropped. So I know I've got work to do here. I went to, uh, uh, I won't name. I went to a professional development day where the writers of the curriculum were unpacking. And I did ask, why is this particular phrase being dropped? And I felt it, I felt it was explained in this way. Are we, are we recording? I have to be, this is how I perceived it, okay? Well, the thing with aesthetic appreciation is, very complex uh, and at the time I was floored I was shocked you know long division is complex we don't remove it you know something that is so key to who we are as human beings uh, should not be removed from the English curriculum especially when two of the four aims are about aesthetic appreciation so I know I've got a lot of work to do here I thought I would share the content pages, um, just a couple of them, just to give you an idea of where I went with this. You know, um, it had to be different text types in different chapters because they were doing very different work. Um, so that that heavy lifting of the of the um, literature review, you know, that has to kind of tell the story uh, of how we got from there to here. Um, you know, I did that walk through the landscape with John Dewey. I had a different tombstone at the start of each of the of the scenes, scene one, scene two, etc. And I stopped and I told him this is what happened. 
you know, this is what came of it. And then he responded in his kind of words from his theory, which made the theory make more sense to me. Um, and then the narrative inquiry methodology, I wrote that chapter quite early. I think you need to. Um, and it was an ABCD and there's a repeating pattern of ABCD, ABCD. And I thought, you know, as a teacher who, or a pre-service teacher even, who needs to teach reading, and you may have seen that's come out in the TEEP report very recently, there's a real issue in graduate teachers not understanding how to teach reading, then this is an ABCD kind of approach to it, um, of talking about reading and how we research reading. Um, uh, and then my my chapters, my all my observations are written up in vignettes. Um, the four teachers I work with had four completely different approaches. I couldn't have I couldn't have foreseen it. I couldn't have imagined it in my wildest dreams that this is how they did it. You know, I was making lots of assumptions myself. But one, definitely through read alouds and through the personal and and social emotional. Uh, general capability, uh, teaching from that. It had just come out in the, what was the big report, Susan? What was the big, it had just come out in the great big report that we needed to teach from the general capabilities. So she was giving this a go. Um, it was gold, you know, uh, it was literature based. And then the, the second teacher, book blether. It was a dialogic approach to improve speaking and listening. Um, so, and then one did poetry and another did drama. So very different um, approaches. So from my thesis, I, uh, I haven't written as much as I'd like to. Uh, I've been slammed with teaching, which is fine, I guess. Uh, I cannot wait to start writing. As I say, I've got four um, books, uh, um, four Palgrave pivots. They're just small books for each of my chapters there uh, on the on the different approaches. Um, my, I've got book chapters from work I'm doing with Liz about departing radically in academic writing. Uh, that's been a real, it's become a real passion. Um, and um, the, I've got two, two from my, um, two articles from my PhD so far, uh, but, but, but with, yeah, many more in the pipeline, I hope. And then I thought, how are we going for time, Susan? Um, I just wanted to share with you uh, a presentation I gave um, as an example of uh, writing differently, of palimpsesting, and I can explain what palimpsesting is, and I, you know, I discovered it through draw, and because I carry all these children's books in my head from my teacher librarian work, you know, I, I can be at an event or at, you know, in a class and I feel oh this children's book is needed here um we just had a faculty meeting and the and the dean wanted a, a, um, a reflection and a children's book came to mind and I guess it, it's both a blessing and a curse but this uh, critical autoethnography conference I dipped my toes in uh, autoethnography there you know as a narrative inquirer I thought I definitely need to expand my my understanding and knowledge of different kind of methodological approaches um, and went to this conference where the theme was composting and the work um the, the key the key work was Donna Haraway's work on the um, Anthropocene and uh, planetary effects. And that's how the composting had kind of come from, from Donna Haraway's work on feminism and consciousness. Um, so uh, the, the book that came to mind for me for this one was, I've got it here somewhere, Just One B. Just one B. Um, it, it was in the uh, shortlist last year, was it? Possibly last year, the year before. Um, and, and I could hear lines of this book coming to me. Um, so in my, in my, um, 
in, in this presentation, uh, I wanted to tell a little bit about my story, give some definitions of palimpsests, explanations of palimpsests as composting, and then give a palimpsestuous performance, uh, which I want to share with you. So, uh, you know, introducing myself, I have been advocating children's right to read since 1997, where I very fortunately, early in my teaching career, uh, was given uh, um, a project leader position uh, directly for the incoming Labour government who wanted to do a trial summer school research project. It really didn't go down well because, you know, it's a slap in the face to teachers who've worked so hard with children to say, oh, we can fix reading in a summer school. Um, but I was I was glad of the experience so early on. Um, so palimpsests are actually an ancient form of recycling. Um, you know, when writing was carved on stone. Um, I've just got to get my, my notes here. Um, it's considered an ancient form of recycling, which the Oxford English Dictionary defines as a writing surface on which the original text has been effaced or erased and then overwritten by another. So French literary theorist Gérard Genet, a leading authority on palimpsest writes, any text, you know, whether you think you're palimpsesting or not, any text is a hypertext, grafting itself onto an earlier text that imitates or transforms, any writing is rewriting, and literature is always in the second degree. And then this second book, these have become my palimpsesting Bibles. Uh, I've got them right here. Battles writes, writing is always palimpsestic. There is no setting down that is not a setting among or a setting upon. So there's lots of different approaches to palimpsesting. And, and you know, um, Jeanette does warn it could be seen as forgery. So we've got to be very careful here that we reference very accurately when we're doing this kind of work. But it, it ranges from a kind of pastiche caricature to a uh, transformation, transposition. And in it, there are five categories. Uh, from intertextuality to hypertextuality. And I won't go into these now, um, but I made those links between palimpsesting and composting and giving life, giving new life to old words, perhaps, is a nice way of looking um, at palimpsesting. I'll leave these in um, for you, Susan. I, I think, are you uploading this? Um, and then I made the connections to Kin through Donna Haraway's work and then talked about my own work in palimpsesting, that when I hear these lines um, in conversation and I'm out and about and it's, I can hear a line from a children's book, um, it has led me to kind of do this palimpsest work. I've written from badly drawn dog to goodly drawn research in explaining my journey. Uh, I've written Belinda's Got a Blether Box, um, palimpsesting on Gordon's Got a Schnooky. I've written a chapter called The Most Magnificent Thesis, um, based on Ashley Spire's Magnificent Thing. And I've got a chapter in the Draw, Not the Guide book, um, How to Do Draw by Me the Drawer, uh, that palimpsests on How to Get Married by Me the Bride. Um, so I, I'd say it's just become kind of almost a signature move because of my virtual backpack and what I'm bringing to this work. So I wanted to share with you today an example then of just one B. Okay, so I've changed from just one B to just one reading for enjoyment teacher. In the tests, in the targets, in the attainment measures of a marketized education system, one reading for enjoyment teacher wonders, when, how, where, what can I do? Just me, just one reading for enjoyment teacher. Then in the widening gap, 
one reading for enjoyment teacher sees a young student who reads for enjoyment. It can't be, she says. There are no more students who read for enjoyment. It is a reader, a lone, frail, frightened and fragile little book reader. But what use is one reader without another reader, wonders one reading for enjoyment teacher, and one and wonders on. In one reading for enjoyment teacher's dream, the world is full of children who read volitionally and avidly for enjoyment. In the tests, in the targets, in the attainment measures of neoliberal datafication, one reading for enjoyment teacher sees another educator interested in students' reading. It can't be, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. There are no more reading teachers. But it is a smug data collector, a seated comprehension tester, a stay away from our benchmark scores school library demolisher. No books here, says other educator. I just need help, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. No help here is the standardised assessment test obsessed educator. Help to make children's reading enjoyable. Stop the wreckage of read aside, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Help to make change. Nothing to see here, says other educator. No change needed. I've got my worksheets, my comprehension test sheets, my text to deconstruct, my levelled basals. So go away. You have a real children's book? Asks one reading for enjoyment teacher. My book to deconstruct? But if you have a children's book, we can grow a classroom of readers, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Nonsense, says the reading for narrow, reductive and quantified measures educator. I saw a child reading for enjoyment, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. And if there are two children reading for enjoyment, then they can engage in vibrant book talks and share peer recommendations based on their reading preferences and other activities associated with a robust reading for enjoyment pedagogy. But other educator won't listen. Other educator won't agree. One plus one does not make many, says other educator. Where did I see that book loving child? One reading for enjoyment teacher wonders. Was it where the dust whirled? Was it where the wind howled? Too much wondering, says the other educator. I'll go and I'll bring back beautiful books, high quality, high interest children's literature, and then we can see. I'll find that child reading, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Nothing to see, shouts other educator. Your dreams aren't welcome here. The comprehension tests continue to numb minds. The inane benchmark targets kill students' love of reading. The attainment measures systematically eradicate another generation of readers. But that doesn't stop one reading for enjoyment teacher. And she brings back a bookcase full of high quality, high interest children's literature, deep and rich in aesthetic potential. Just a start says one reading for enjoyment teacher, but just enough. Stay away, cries other educator. Don't meddle, don't touch. One reading for enjoyment teacher doesn't touch, but she doesn't stay away and she doesn't stop. Just watch what happens, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Other educator watches. Oh, that's not a child reading volitionally and enjoying the aesthetic experience for its educative value. 
is that a child reading volitionally and enjoying the aesthetic experience for its educative value? It is a child reading volitionally and enjoying the aesthetic experience for its educative value. So what? It's only one child. Just wait and see, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Other educator waits. But those aren't leveled texts. So many children's books in which the primary purpose is aesthetic. Books, so what? Now just look, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. Or the educator looks. Many children reading, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. A whole school of children reading. You're just one reading for enjoyment teacher, says other educator. That's all it takes, really, says one reading for enjoyment teacher. And now we're an inclusive community of engaged readers, say the children. Including me, says other educator. The end. Or just the beginning, I hope. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, oh, Emily. Emily. <laughs> Thank you. What a what a beautiful way to uh, to bring your presentation to an end. Do you know I found myself smiling for the entire duration of your presentation. Your passion is palpable. Thanks, uh, Susan. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, we've got a couple of minutes just for some quick questions, thoughts, or, or comments. Um, you're very welcome to pop something into the chat, or if given it's a small group. Um, you're very welcome to, to just unmute. I'd love to kick off, though, with just a question around courage and what what the thread through your presentation was, wow, I, the, it obviously you obviously drew on an incredible courage to depart so radically um, on such a big venture. And I, I'm just curious around what, what fed that courage for you? Oh, I have to say, Susan, the draw community. Absolutely. You know, because I, I was able to test things there. You know, sometimes in the morning we might read aloud. Sometimes it's very quiet and we just want to get on with things. Uh, we have a monthly meeting where we can, you know, test some of our writing and see if it works. And you know, they, they will tell you they're, they're, you know, very good with their feedback, very constructive with their feedback. So, you know, I, I had this amazing community who were um, very generous to, to listen and, you know, that peer feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we were all coming from very, very different kind of angles, different studies, um, different theorists. Um, but but the, what we had in common was this, you know, these four rules and wanting our writing to have impact. Um, so I think had had I had to do that journey alone, there's no way I, I, I could have um, created that thesis. It, it definitely was um, on the shoulders of the draw community, you know. Yeah, thanks, Millie. Um, I think uh, Terry has captured it in her beautiful comment in the chat where she says, oh, my goodness, my heart is aching with how much I love this. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Oh, that means the world to me. Thank you. Are there any other questions or any thoughts or comments, any curiosities that uh, people would like to take this opportunity to, to share or to ask Millie? Um, I have a question. Hi, Melly. My name's Rebecca. Lovely to Hi. have a chance to listen to you. Um, you talked about slow pedagogy, which is something I think is really interesting in terms of um, helping teachers understand that you don't do one thing once in your classroom and, you know, everything will kind of emerge from this beautiful moment. I was just wondering if you could maybe share a little bit more about your thinking around this idea of slow pedagogy. I, I can gosh in in a moment yeah, I guess I <laughs> I you know I I began to understand um 
well, definitely reading as a transaction mm -hmm. and that, you know, from, from Dewey's theory, um, that aesthetic experience takes time, that it's never that in the moment joy. It's, mm. it's definitely not about that. It's something that leaves an experience that leaves a residue that, that, that you feel the next day, you know, you, you can hear it, see it, smell it, whatever it is. And it, it cannot be instantaneous. Mm. So, you know, for example, that the books we were reading, uh, you know, and the teachers were reading, um, what, what I found in my study that often there was a line in the text that they, they then drew on, you know, like, like, for example, a most magnificent, you know, if you read that book to your students, a most magnificent thing, and then you can say to your students, is that most magnificent? Is that your most magnificent writing? No, I reckon you can have another go at that. But all these catchphrases came into their vernacular from books. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's almost that works kind of as a metaphor that this aesthetic enjoyment is something that stays with you, mm -hmm. that you can hear it, feel it. You know, it's it's it sits below the surface of consciousness, mm -hmm. but in a moment it comes back to you and it, it stirs in you. And it doesn't have to be something enormous, but it stirs in you some some little thing that makes you either want to read more mm -hmm. or perhaps um, respond and respond in an artistic way, you know, to mm. respond, you know, dear author, you know, you got that wrong. No way would that happen, you know, and, and it's not necessarily joy. It can be frustration. It can be sorrow. It can be, you know, the full gamut of human emotion, mm. but it's stirred and something the next day, the next week, the next month is still sitting there. Um, the residue of this experience and and so you know I, I think that's where reading for enjoyment gets gets misunderstood that it's not a ha 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 funny joke I just read now um, but it, it it's uh, an experience I've had with this literature that really struck a chord and I'm you know I'm still loving it now um, mm, beautiful thank you thanks and Millie I I We'll just go back to some of the, those words that you just shared around the residue stay, staying with you for, for quite some time. I think today's presentation will stay with many of us for quite some time. It was a beautifully moving and powerful and thought-provoking presentation. So thank you so much from all of us for taking the time in what I know is a very busy schedule to share with us today. Um, I think I know I've taken many things that will stay with me um, for a considerable period of time and things that I'd like to investigate further, as I'm sure um, many of us have. So thank you, Millie, for your time this thank Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you all in draw. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And Ruth shared um, something also in the chat. Um, so wonderful to hear your work and um, the commentary on your courage to depart radically really resonates. So um, thanks, Ruth, for sharing that as well. Um, so our next session um, will be on Thursday, the 28th of September, and we have Dr. Kate Halcrow presenting an acoustic turn for creative writing classroom, bringing music, speech, and sound to the world of text. So um, hopefully you'll be able to join us then. It's been beautiful having you all join us this afternoon. And um, Melly, you're probably unaware that we have some some, um, participants who are joining us from the other side of the world. So Terry's oh, joining okay. us from South Africa. So uh, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Your the wonderful work is, is reaching um, across the globe. Thank so, you. Thanks everyone for joining today and um, go well, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next time in September. <laughs>